I want to start by telling you about my favorite health services research book. It's the book I require everyone on my research team to read. And it's actually a baseball book, Moneyball, by Michael Lewis. It tells the story of how the Oakland A's under general manager Billy Bean defied a basic baseball rule. The teams that spend the most money win the most games. That was the rule. And the rule is translatable into numbers. Baseball teams spend on average more than $2 million on player salaries per win. The winningest teams spend closer to $3 million per win. The Oakland A's, however, were the exception, making the playoffs nearly every year through 2002 with one of the lowest payrolls in the sport. They spent less than $500,000 per win. Dollar for dollar, they were the most effective team in baseball by a huge distance. And the question that Michael Lewis asked was, how? And the answer was, Billy Bean, the general manager, believed in research. You have to understand how radical this was. Sports teams are traditionally believed to succeed through talent and experience, not science, and baseball was no exception. Great managers believe that the key decisions, such as which players to draft, which pitcher to send in, whether to tell a player to try and steal second base, should be determined by experience and instinct, not data. But Billy Bean put Harvard kids with laptops, geeks, in his scouting meetings anyway, and watched them all but come to, to blows with the grizzled veterans' scouts over which players were the right ones to pick. To the veterans, the decisions were no-brainers. Do you take an 18-year-old high school phenom with rocket speed and a swing that could send Homer so far it would make grandmothers cry, or the fat college kid who couldn't run, throw, or field, but according to the data, the geeks were pushing, racked up more walks than any other college kids. <laughs> Billy Bean did the strange thing and decided the geeks should win. He believed they were generating new knowledge. And he built year after year of success capitalizing on that knowledge. That is until Lewis blew it for him by telling everyone else about it and the rest of <laughs> baseball caught on. So by the way, that fat kid that the scouts didn't want to look at that Lewis wrote about in 2002, that was Kevin Euclid, who's now a two-time World Series winner for the Red Sox and one of the top hitters in baseball. If we were in charge, we'd call what Billy Bean introduced baseball services research. <laughs> you know, because that just sounds so sexy. <laughs> Lewis called it Moneyball. The statistician Bill James called it saber metrics. Billy Bean just called it stats. Whatever you call it, though, he took a field of human endeavor thought to be far too complex to understand or to master through anything but instinct and experience and demonstrated that actions and decisions based on intelligent an analysis of detailed data could be significantly better. They were by no means always right, but they were right more often. And the result was a team that played better and won far more often than its payroll suggested it had any right to. This was a shift in thinking for baseball that is, I believe, exactly like the one we're experiencing in medicine and in public health. We're in the midst of an enormous transformational shift from a professional world that has believed that great results are based primarily on individual talent and training and not on data and organization. The key decisions, such as what steps to follow in a difficult operation, how to manage a pneumonia, whether someone should undergo a CT scan, are made first and foremost on the basis of individual experience. The kind of things that people look to, the kind of things that people trust, is a doctor's pedigree, the hospital's name, the technology available. We who are here are a group of people who believe this is not enough. We believe that data and systems matter, that data can reveal new knowledge, otherwise invisible to individual observation. 
and that execution of that new knowledge through systems change can save lives. And so the reason I'm so honored to be here with you is that you've chosen to celebrate some of the work my team has done in trying to follow that path. There's nothing in our work introducing a safe surgery checklist that is especially original. All we did was take a set of principles that many, many people have shown to produce better results and applied them in the field of surgery. The first principle was to recognize that people who take on complex tasks, such as providing medical care, are prone to recurrent lapses. They have lapses of memory, lapses from weighing recent vivid experiences too much, lapses from being unable to see the cumulative pattern of low-level errors. They have limits to their success because individual effort, although critical, is not sufficient. The second principle was that practices guiding by, guided by looking at the patterns of lapses, by looking at data, are likely to have better results. My team also had some specific models to follow. Don Berwick's Institute for Healthcare Improvement's use of bundles and checklists to reduce medication errors and ventilator-associated pneumonias. Peter Pronovos and the Michigan Hospital Association's use of a checklist to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections. And so under the project, a project with the World Health Organization, we took a close look at the data on the dominant patterns of lethal surgical complications and the practices that seemed most likely to avert them. The data we have on clinical medicine are still embarrassingly primitive and spotty. But like Billy Bean, we stuck to the principles. We gambled on the laptop kids and what, the, what their data suggested. We distilled the practices identified into a kind of pilot's checklist for the operating room, worked on it to make it actually usable in the moment of care with three pause points and 19 items that teams could check in under 90 seconds to make sure they had completed. These were mundane but periodically overlooked critical steps, such as making sure an antibiotic was given before incision and that the team confirms it has the right blood and fluids and IV access for the operation. And there were some interesting, under-recognized steps that seemed important to ensure teamwork, such as making sure everyone in the room has been introduced by name and that the nurse and anesthesiologist have no questions or concerns before the surgeon puts the knife to the skin. We then implemented the checklist in eight hospitals around the world, top hospitals in high-income settings, ranging from Seattle and London to Auckland and Toronto, and hospitals in Jordan, rural Tanzania, Manila, and Delhi with far less resources. It was a gamble. The surgical teams, especially my surgical colleagues, often viewed the whole thing as a waste of time. Many believed a checklist process might even be harmful by diverting attention from usual practices based on experience. But Moneyball was right. In every hospital, use of the checklist and our program to introduce it produced a reduction in complications. The average reduction was 36%. And the redu reductions were just as significant in the high-income hospitals as in the low-income hospitals. All in all, the cohort of patients who received the checklist also had 27 fewer deaths, a reduction of 47%. In the year and a half since publication, the use of this approach for surgical care has caught on. More than 20 countries have embraced it as a national standard, and we're now this month up to 4,000 hospitals implementing it. We're also just now seeing reports from Denmark, from Kenya, from Stanford, confirming substantial reductions in complications with in complications with adoption. But we also still have a lot to learn about how to ensure this is effectively implemented when done at scale. The practices of effective leadership for clinical and public health change need to be no less data driven. But the more profound and substantial difficulty is achieving the cultural change that this type of work requires. Moneyball research, that is research using the statistical patterns of healthcare and the healthcare system to guide how medicine should be practiced day to day is still in its much disputed infancy. 
there remains tremendous doubt among people in medicine and the public at large that this kind of enterprise, the kind of work we all do, will yield genuinely better results for the safety, quality, or cost of healthcare. Some of that doubt, to be sure, is not misplaced. Success is not a given. The patterns that the laptop kids try to discern in human affairs are only going to be seen dimly. There will be mistakes and misinterpretations. There will be overreading of the data and our own kind of wishful thinking. But our bet is that efforts to look for patterns and modify practices to follow them are going to be more successful on average than efforts to ignore the patterns. The scientific improvement of healthcare and health systems has long roots. More than a century ago, doctors such as William Osler first emphasized the careful recording of the pattern of symptoms that patients had, and then when they died, correlation between the recorded symptoms and what was found inside them at autopsy. Osler encouraged the study of probabilities to unlock the secrets in these patterns and he founded the modern residency system at Johns Hopkins to wean young doctors away from the lore taught in apprenticeships and drive them to practice more scientifically. Medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability, he used to say. We've come fascinatingly far following science and the probabilities since then. They've shown us the basic properties of thousands of diseases and provided an arsenal of more than 6,000 drugs and 4,000 medical and surgical procedures. But we've been slow to accept the idea that the effective deployment of this arsenal might require science, might require design according to the patterns and probabilities. This has long been regarded as purely a matter for the art of medicine, and that has proved to be a colossal mistake. The old views, however, are beginning to change. Our infant science of statistical medicine feels to me like how I imagine the infant science of biomedicine felt in 1940. The scientists had an approach that was to prove to be of enormous value to society. They were on the cusp of discovering antibiotics and vaccines and such basics as the proper composition of intravenous fluids. But despite the prospects, funding was meager and skepticism ran high not least among the doctors and other healthcare professionals themselves. That changed with results. And that's the challenge we all now face in this field. We spent two decades or more chronicling the patterns, recording the symptoms and pathologies of our systems of healthcare delivery. We've discovered the social disparities. We've discovered the risk factors for errors the sources of imperiling waste of resources. But these discoveries mean little until we use the information to make change, until we use the science to discover and prove over and over again that we can help, that we can make healthcare better with higher quality, less harm, lower cost, better health. This requires a daunting shift in thinking. We in this field have been mostly diagnosticians to this point. It is time now to test solutions. And by the way, it is time to test solutions, not just in America or even in the West. The science of health systems, the kids with the laptops looking for patterns can make the delivery of healthcare and public health everywhere better. It can help the poorest to the richest. It can save the life of a patient in rural Tanzania, no less than here in Boston. So here's to you kids with the laptops, no personalized identifiers on there. <laughs> Thank you for this year's Impact Award.